about. Um, I, I want to be careful about promoting a building. I've done that a lot over, over the years, and um, I've seen God do amazing things. I really have. Um, I remember the, the, it was the second church I was in. I was in Missouri, and uh, they had me, do, I was in uh, Mexico, Missouri. I was actually living in Santa Fe, which is a post office. And that's all it is. And, uh, but Mexico was the, the town there, and there it was uh, the bigger town. And it was, it was about uh, 23 miles from where I lived. But there was a church building there to rent, and they, the group I was with, they knew that I could, you know, maintain buildings and stuff, and uh, that that uh, I had already started one church in Southern California, and so they asked if I would uh, be the caretaker there, and at the same time start a church. And uh, uh, I said yes, and so we found this building. And, well, start a church. We need a building, and so they sent from St. Louis. They sent the overseer out because I had a building to rent and they they I was still really young and they were checking on me making sure I wasn't you know doing things too crazy and so I showed them that I was telling them all about the building man it was nice it was it was like in a U uh, kind of a U shape and it was a fellowship and a sanctuary and classrooms and a kitchen and I was all excited and, and so the the uh, the district overseer and his associate pastor came down to Mexico. It's about a three-hour drive, and they wanted to go see the real estate agent with me that was going to rent me the building. And so they started asking me questions about it. Well, what do they want? Well, they said they'd let me rent it for four uh, four four hundred a month. And he said, "Okay, great." Um, and we're driving down, <laughs> down to his office, and I'm sitting in back, and, and the overseer looked back and said, "So does he want a, uh, uh, does he want a deposit?" Yeah, I think they want a $400 deposit. This was in like 80, 88, I think. And uh, he said, "Okay." And then he looked back again, and I'm sitting in the back as he's driving. He said, "So d how much money do you have?" I said, "None." He said, "What?" I said, don't worry, I think it'll all work out. They, they were just like, man, we're going to look like egg on the face. So we went in there and they're sitting in the office and one guy was dealing back and forth with us, going back to the big guy and he came out and he said, you know the rent is 400 a month and he said, said do you have that on you now? I said, no, I thought you would, there's a lot of work to do. I thought you would give me a month on that. And they said, okay. And then they went back and they said, now the deposit is 400. And yeah, I thought you would give me a month on that too. Oh, the boss said, okay. And so um, we got in a building for nothing. <laughs> and God, God paid the bills. God saved people and got people together and God paid the bills. So whether it's 400 or 400,000 or 4 million, if God's in it, it's okay. Amen. And so, but I'm not trying to, talk about going eyebrow deep and dead or anything don't 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 worry about that but but God God has been faithful God has been faithful and so um, I want you to pray with me that God opens a great door of revival let's ask God for a move of his spirit in this community to save souls I mean bartenders can get saved Drug dealers can get saved. Uh, 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 people uh, living uh, in lives contrary to God's word can get saved. Hey, God saves everybody. God saved a murderer by the name of the Apostle Paul, <laughs> Saul of Tarsus. So God can, God, God, God can do it. And He used an, <laughs> another murderer in the Old Testament named Moses, right? <laughs> And so let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. And God, we are so grateful for your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for putting that on Abby's heart, dear God. 
We must be careful that we have forgiveness in our heart. And Lord, when we, when we realize that you've forgiven us and you've come to our life, dear God, and, and you're changing us to even want to forgive, to even desire to forgive is a, is a move of God on a, on a human heart. And Lord, we just ask you for a great move of your spirit. The songs this morning were, the first couple were about prayer, dear God. Lord, when you said, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, God, I ask you to help me not to be so busy, but to spend more and more and more time in prayer. Lord, not to beg you or not to twist your arm or not to think that I'm, uh, uh, I have a badge because of a, amount of time I spend in prayer, but God, that I may become more like you. God, I, there's areas of my life I'm so unlike Jesus. I need you, God. I ask you for mercy. I ask you for grace. And God, we lift this community up. What a testimony to this community, dear God, to see, Lord, people saved and delivered by the power of God, not religious, not become religious, dear God, Lord, but really saved, delivered from sin, delivered from, from the things that hold us bound, dear God. We ask you for this, God bless, Lord, we pray. The message today, open my heart and mind, help me say the things you once said. God, from your word, let it burn in our hearts and lives, I ask. Amen and amen. So if you could turn to, we're going to read from Acts chapter 3. I'll read the, um, the scripture text from John chapter 12 and verse number 32, where Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now that's a promise. That's a promise. I, I don't know. No one really knows the, the deep thoughts of your heart like you do. And no man can know it unless God would give them the word of knowledge, okay? Or a, a prophecy about what you're thinking. Other than that, People can guess, I can guess, okay? But don't ever, and you've, I've done this, I've come across people or talked to people, and sometimes people I knew around here, and the first thought that comes to me is, man, they, they would never get saved they would never get saved don't don't do that i'm guilty of that at times that that first thought come well thoughts can come that doesn't mean you're a bad person it's what you do with them <laughs> i quickly re devil get out of here <laughs> because god can save anyone and everyone and Believe it or not, a lot of times the worst of the worst gets saved before the goody two-shoes. Because a lot of times people say, well, I never did this in school. I was good at school. I always came home after school. I did my homework. I did this. I obeyed my mom and dad. I did it. That doesn't make you saved. In fact, usually it makes you uh, a Pharisee, okay? Um, that's good that there's areas you didn't go in your life. That's a good thing. It's a positive. There's a lot of areas I wish I wouldn't have gone because that you, you bring battles and things, uh, ammu, ammunition that the devil can use against you. Okay? But God, God can save. God can save the biggest, the baddest, the meanest, the honoriest, the crankiest. A lot of times the people that are the angriest and uh, all, you know, just, just living in a rage, 
It's because there's an inner fight going on and they know they need to get right. They're fed up with themselves <laughs> and they know they need to get right. So, so Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men. Every, you think about this, every man, woman, and child in the world is being drawn to Jesus. Now, many reject, many turn to Satan, I mean, outright become Satan worshipers and all of that. That's between them and their own soul, and they're going to have to answer to God, okay? But anyone you ever talk to, they are being drawn to Jesus because he said he would do it. He said he would do it, okay? And so th this is exciting. I want to, I want to read... We, we've been talking about, preaching about lifting up, lifting Jesus higher and compelling them, um, kind of a subtitle here. And in chapter 3, I want to read through this um, down to about verse 10 and just kind of pull some things out of this as, as we read together. I'll be reading from the uh, uh, King James this morning. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. Now some things to notice here in Acts chapter 3. Peter and John, they went up together. When you give your heart to God, God wants us to be in unity. Okay, and they were going up at the hour of prayer. There was a, a time, certain set times of prayer. Do you have certain set times of prayer? Well, you know, and I, I heard uh, someone say, well, uh, just throughout the day, uh, you can just stop and say, thank you, Jesus. I love you. Uh, you're so good to me. And uh, you do that 60 times a day, that takes about a minute. That's, that's an hour of prayer, okay? Yes, okay. Uh, technically, I guess, if you're watching your stopwatch, uh, that may be, okay? But it's talking, there's something about a set time. Uh, not necessarily a length of time, because there's times it said Jesus prayed all night, there's times that uh, other people prayed for, for longer than an hour, okay? It's not necessarily a, a length of time, but a time when you come to God. And how do you know when you really pray? When you come to God, and whether you're reading the scripture or you're praying, and you just feel a release. There's something about the presence of God. And we talked about it last week. There is a universal presence of God. God is everywhere. He's in all places at all times. Psalms 139, David said, there's no place I can go to escape from God's spirit. If I go to heaven, he's there. If I go to hell, he's there. If I take the wings of the morning and go to the othermost parts of the earth, behold, thou art there. Okay, God is everywhere. He's everywhere at all times. But there is a manifest presence. Because God, God is in, is, is, is in the bar room. Okay? But it doesn't mean people recognize him. God, God, by his Holy Spirit, is dealing with people in the bar room. He dealt with me in the bar room. Uh, among other places. But... God, God is in the bar room, yes, okay, but that doesn't mean that people acknowledge that he's in the bar room. They, they're not, you know, very few people are in there praising God and saying, God, I surrender my life to you, okay? And so, and so God is, is, is looking to just touch your life. Have you ever been to the, the bedside of someone that was really sick? I mean, like out there sick on a vent or something like that. And you just touch their hand and you can feel them squeeze your hand. That's when you know you touch God. When you just know. 
Someone touched me. I don't understand everything, but someone's touching me right now. That's what you're looking for. And you know, you could be upset at this one, upset at this one, upset, 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 upset. And you get that touch from God, and you're just like, I found out I was allergic to aspirin after many years of just having these hives at a certain times, okay? And um, so I finally found out, hey, it's after I take an aspirin because I hardly take any, any, uh, I don't try to take, take too many drugs. Uh, legal or non-legal, okay? Especially non-legal, okay? Don't do that. But um, anyway, there was, a, there was a time, there was a time that I was just filled with hives. I'd got into some aspirin because it's in a lot of stuff. You have to find out everything aspirin is in after you find out you're allergic to it. And so I got into some aspirin and, and I knew somehow I did this and I had welts on my body, it looked like hotcakes would lift off my body, just, oh man, and they itch like crazy. And so a friend of mine said, come on, you're a veteran, I can take you to the VA. And uh, we were in St. Louis, Missouri, and he took me to the VA, I didn't even know I could go. I said, what, I can go there? He said, yeah, I didn't even know. And so we go there, this guy comes and looks at me, and he has my shirt off, I'm sitting on there, This nurse guy comes looks at me I'll be back he comes, he comes walking in later has a needle and puts it in my arm Shh. he walks away and I just felt it's like someone let the air out of me I just felt the the welts and everything just shrinking and the itching and the burning going away Whoa. he came back I said what was in that <laughs> But you know you've touched God when the junk of the world, the responsibilities of life, or whatever's getting at you, whatever's eating you, it just, it may not go away, but the peace of God, you know you've prayed or you've touched God through his word when it's just like, ah, that's prayer. That's prayer. So they went up at the hour of prayer. They had a set time that they would go to pray. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask an alms. And Peter fastening his eyes on him. Now, this is the Apostle Peter that uh, was part of the crowd arguing of who's going to be in control when Jesus is gone. <laughs> this is the, the, the disciples before and after Pentecost, the study on them is amazing, okay? The, the, the arguing, the fussing, the pride, all of these things. But here they are. Jesus had gone on, died, gone, risen, gone on to Kevin. The Holy Spirit had fallen upon them in Acts chapter 2 and remained with them forever. And Here's this lame man. The Bible said that, um, I think it's uh, chapter 4, verse 22, it said that he was above 40 years old. You think of this man. So it said they laid him every day at the gate. So for 40 years, this guy, now I know all of us have, have issues that we deal with, but can you imagine 40 years, a life of begging? Now, I don't know if you've ever been 
in a place. I have living in, in inner cities and ministering in inner cities, been in a place where there's beggars like you get to know them by first name, okay? And they kind of become just part of the the core of the street, you know? It's just, oh, there's George today or John or whoever, okay? And, but, but, when you see them for the first time, a lot of times you're like, oh, look at that poor fella. But you kind of get used to it, okay? So I'm saying that because here's this man. He's laid at the gate every day. Most people got used to him. Oh, there's, there's uh, you know, whatever his name, name is. There's Hezekiah, or I don't know what his name was, but, you know, he's just laid there. It doesn't say his name. And most people just got used to him. But here come Peter and John. They're not f from Jerusalem. They're from north, from Galilee. And here they are. They're in town. They're going to a prayer meeting. They come and they see him. And the Bible says, and Peter fastened his eyes upon them. Do you ever take time to fasten your eyes upon the needs of others? Do you ever take time to, to really, and this is the Peter that was all wrapped up in himself. Jesus said, uh, this night all of you forsake me. If I have to die with thee, I will never forsake thee. All of these may forsake thee, but not me. This is Peter. But now he's on the other side of being filled with the Holy Ghost. And he comes across this, this lame man and said he fastened his eyes. You see... When the Holy, Holy Spirit came and entered into them, that the Holy Spirit is also called the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. That is how God lives in His people, through the Holy Spirit. After we repent of our sin, God forgive me, I believe Jesus died for me, okay? And now we, we, uh, Jesus comes in and he lives in us. So here's, here's proud, arrogant, selfish Peter. Now filled with the Holy Ghost. And now he's conducting his life like his master. A scripture reference is Matthew chapter, chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36 Many people came around, and it says of Jesus, it said, and when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. He was moved. Inside, he, was, he, 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 he felt their pain. He felt their suffering. This is what God, this is what God does when he comes and lives in us. That's why, do you know why? It's, it, 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 that's why I talked about prayer at first when you just like touch God and you're like, God touches you and you're like, oh. because when you touch God and God touches you, you know how much you need him. You know how messed up you were, whether you were the uh, bank robber or whether you were the Pharisee that God had to really struggle to even get you to admit you sinned once or twice in your life. <laughs> okay? G you know who you are. And when, you, when, when you're in the presence of God, there's really no argument. There's no argument of how much I need his forgiveness how much I need his grace, how much I need his mercy. That's why we should, there should be an hour. And what that meant is not that they spent an hour, but it was the time that they meet for prayer. How long they prayed, I'm not really sure, okay? But we need that hour of prayer. We need that time in our life where we shut things out and shut things down and we pray. We go to God. And this, this is what Peter and John were doing. And when they were they're going up there, they see this man, and Peter fastened his eyes. It wasn't a, oh, look at that poor, dirty beggar. Man, he needs to get saved. That's religion. That's not salvation. Salvation 
salvation is and and I'm waiting for what God's going to do around here. Oh man, you we're going to hear testimonies of forgiveness because ooh, a lot of stuff that's gone on, a lot of stuff that is that is kept in the dark and under uh and and people self-medicate with drugs and alcohol okay that's everywhere in the world now okay but man just when god when god moves and people different ones really get saved talk about some testimony services that'll be there'll be no preaching there there's going to be testimony services where no I, nobody can preach we all need to just pray and go to God and just you I'm I'm talking about revival this is going this is in my heart okay this is this is in my soul and I know I know it can happen I know that's what God wants to do God can do that this wicked vile city uh, called Nineveh when when a, a, a preacher with an attitude and prejudice in his heart called Jonah went in there and and man he had a sorry message what a message I mean it wasn't thought out out, prayed out or anything he just said yet 40 days and God's going to destroy this place he walked through town walked out and went and sat in the shade and the Bible says from the king to the lowest they began to repent and the king proclaimed a fast and wouldn't even let the animals eat he, they made the animals fast And they all repented and God forgave all of them and Jonah said that's why I didn't want to come here God because I knew you would forgive them and they've done us wrong and I want you to destroy them <laughs> I'm glad I'm not God well you may be glad I'm not God and and I'm probably glad you're not God amen but Jesus when he saw the multitude, it said he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. That's no guidance and that's no protection. Isn't that a picture of humanity today? No guidance, no true guidance and no true protection. And so Peter fastened his eyes upon him. With John and said, look on us. We're talking about lifted, lifting up Jesus. Now that sounds like a, a proud statement, but it's not. When you know what you know, you know it. Okay, I know that sounds deep, but. Uh, <laughs> Peter knew he had the goods. He said, look on us. Said, silver and gold, have I none? I like a, a recent, well, I guess the last few years somewhere, understanding that I received of that is Peter wasn't claiming poverty because really he had access to everything he needed, right? He wasn't claiming poverty he was claiming your need cannot be met by silver and gold. I, I like that rendition then, you know. Uh, see, the poor preacher, he didn't have anything, okay? Because in the Bible, God made a lot of people very rich. And some used it, some abused it, but some used it for good. And that's what God wants us to do with what, whatever substance we have is to be a blessing to others. Yes, you have to take care of yourself, but to be a blessing to others. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. Peter and John knew what they had. They knew it. They knew it. In our Bible study, we've been, we may be in it again Wednesday night. We've been talking about um, the Lord's Prayer and where it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay. Uh, a, a lot of times, and, and people use it a lot of times praying for someone sick.
they'll pray and then they'll say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Okay? Uh, and I've been kind of tearing that up because I think it's really abused and used out of context. That, that saying was used one time by Jesus when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and said, Father, if, if it's possible that this cup can pass from me, meaning if I don't have to go through all this shame, the Bible said he despised the shame, but he endured the cross, okay? It was used one time, and I've heard so many people in, in Christendom at the different places I've been, Lord, thy will be done, thy will be done. If I'm sick and you come and pray and then say, my, Lord, thy will be done, don't pray for me, because that you just negated all the faith that you mustered up when you prayed. Peter did not say this. This is an example of the first biblical example of the disciples praying for someone to be healed after, after Pentecost, after being filled with the Holy Ghost. Peter said, look on us, silver and gold have I now, such as I have, give I thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Father, if it be thy will, rise him up. No, is it... Peter knew this was the will of God. Instead of saying, thy will be done, we should be searching the scripture to find out what the will is. Amen? What is God's will? Well, uh, I got a neighbor. I'd really like him to be saved. I wish I knew God's will on it. You'd, I'll tell you God's will. God said, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen? You're praying for a wayward child or a wayward sibling or, or, or a family member or a good friend. It's God's will that they get saved. Will they get saved? That's something between God. But the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. That's right. But what do you do with your horse anyway? You take him to the water right <laughs> you take them to the water so this friend this family member this neighbor whoever it may be make sure you bring them to the water they may say i don't want water today that's fine that's fine but you did your part you brought them to the water you brought them to the water peter said such you think about this such as I have, give I thee. Let's turn to John chapter number 14. John chapter number 14. What a statement. I've heard of, I've heard of, of preachers uh, getting in trouble um, revivalists and revival in different places to where the preacher um, they tried to put him in jail for practicing medicine without a license because people were being healed in the services <laughs> there's there's several accounts of that that going on who is this Peter say uh, uh, hey blind man I don't have money but what I have I'm gonna give to you get up and walk Peter knew what he had. This is deep. This is really deep. Do we know what we have? <laughs> Do we? And that's another reason I need to stay in prayer because daily the problems of life, the issues, the, the government, the, the just everything going on in the world just kind of beats you down and you're just like, oh, man, I mean, man, okay? But that's why you got to go to God in prayer and stay in the presence of God for God to remind you, hey, son, daughter, listen, that's what the world thinks. This is what I say. There's a big difference. Chapter uh, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. I want to read from verse 14, just down a few verses, okay? Probably down to 23. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you, how long? Forever. 
another comforter, and it means one like me. I've been here. I've been taking care of all your needs. I've been healing the sick. I've been uh, paying the bills. I've been doing this. I've been doing this. You guys have been following me for three years, and I'm going, and you're sad. This is John 14. I go to prepare a place for you at the beginning of it, and now he's, he's, he's teaching them more. He said, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to pray the Father give you another comforter or one just like me. He'll abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. That's, that's a really big scripture. You have to be saved to receive the comforter. Okay? The world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. So the Holy Spirit was there, present at the ministry of Christ, and was all around the disciples. But Jesus said, I'm going away, but this comforter, this spirit he, that is with you now and you've witnessed is going to be inside of you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Other, other, I like that New King James, I believe it says, I will not leave you as orphans. And I, uh, through study, I found out that when a teacher like Socrates or Aristotle or, you know, some great teacher, Gamaliel or whatever, they had a following and they were called their children or their, you know, the children of Socrates or the children of Aristotle, whatever, of these great teachers, okay, their followers were called their children. And when that leader died, then the disciples or the followers were called orphans. Well, you're an orphan now. Your leader died, Okay. So Jesus said, don't worry, it's not like that. I'm not going to leave you orphans. He said, <clears throat> verse 19, yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But you, but you see me, because I live, you shall live also. At that day, you shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. I believe he's talking about the day of Pentecost when the comforter comes. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and we will and will manifest myself to him. Now, I want to say this, folks. Brothers and sisters, whoever would be listening, we do people a disservice when we accept their sin. Okay? I don't mean that you have a brother and uh, whatever, he's, he's uh, whatever, a drug dealer. I don't mean that that you you every time you see your brother or he tries to come to your house say you dirty nasty no good drug dealer get out of here okay no hey brother I've been praying for you come on in I was hoping you'd come by I want to witness to you you know God loves you when we allow the drug dealer or the fornicator or the homosexual or the lesbian or the trans, or all, all of that. Well, I'm transitioning, okay? All, all of this. The church is the conscience of the world. The world doesn't have a conscience. The church is the conscience of the world. That's why, that's why the, there are scriptures that show that the rise of the Antichrist cannot fully take place until the church is taken out of here. And that's another teaching in Thessalonians, but... It's a good time, okay? The world doesn't have a conscience. The conscience, and that's why the world fights the church so much. That's why they're trying to make all this legislation about hate speech. Well, you, uh, we don't hate anybody. The church doesn't hate anybody. The true church, we, I don't hate the murderer. I don't hate the adulterer. I don't hate the, the trans or the homosexual or lesbian. I don't hate them. In fact, I love them probably more than their partner.
because I'll tell them the truth. I'm not going to get involved in their sin. But I'll tell them, you know what? God loves you, and you're the reason. You're, you're, that, that sin is one of the reasons Christ died. You can be saved. Jesus said, look at, he said, verse 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. So if I have God's commandments but don't keep them, do I love God? No. And that doesn't mean you have to come point your finger in my face. You don't love God. You don't love God. You don't love God. But it means that I need to know or, or that you need to know why uh, that person is not obeying God's word so they don't love God. So I have to be careful and I have to work with them. I have to work with them according to what is there. And that's not being judgmental, okay? Uh, Abby, you know, was in a war zone, plus she was an EMT and stuff, and so when there's an accident or a bomb or whatever goes off, they come, and if there's are several, several uh, victims or people hurt and casualties or whatever, whatever's going on, they determine, they quickly determine, okay, this one has a broken leg. You, I'm sorry, you're just going to have to deal with your broken leg. This one is bleeding out the ears. This one, is, this, this, this one has an artery sliced. Your broken leg, it's broken, you're in pain. Okay, you don't fix the broken leg while this one has their, their artery cut and they're bleeding out. They'll die in a few minutes. And so... In, in Christianity, when we deal with people, we, we have to assess the damage, what's going on. Wow, my, my, my brother, my brother whom I love very much, he, he's, he doesn't love God according to the Bible. I need to work with him in a way that I'm, I'm leading him to Christ. There's a big, there's a big difference, but that's, that's not the key of the, that's not where I want to end, but I just wanted to point that out. Judas saith unto him, not Is Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Peter was not boasting when he said, look on me and what I have I'm going to give thee. He wasn't, it, it wasn't a boast. Peter knew and this is what he, he knew that God the Father and God the Son came to live this, this man and Peter and all of his mess, and we don't want to rehash it again, but all of Peter's mess, he has been forgiven, and he's been filled with the Holy Spirit, and God the Father and God the Son, through the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God living inside of Peter, and Peter said, what I have, I give you, and I have Jesus, and he's the healer. He's the Savior. He's the Deliverer. This should be the attitude of every child of God. Amen? So often, oh, and, and I understand there's a place for counseling, but you, you, you can't counsel people out of sin. There has to be a heart change. Sometimes to deal with all the, all the trauma that they experienced in sin, they may need a, 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 a someone to come alongside and really break down the scriptures and show them and, and on and on and continue by the, uh, coming to church and Bible study and all of that is, is, is a help, okay? But there has to be a heart change. That's why God said, God said, and two places in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, it said, he said, this is the true proverb that the dog has returned to its own vomit. That, isn't that disgusting? I'm not trying to gross you out, but a dog gets sick and vomits, and what do they do? Okay, all right, we all know what they do. <laughs> Wait a minute, I, that's my child. I'm going to get it again, okay? But it says this, 
and a pig that is washed returns to the wallet. You can wash up a pig, you can dress up a pig. Those of you involved in 4-H, and, and I was too, I, I never took a, uh, I don't think I ever had an animal in 4-H, but I was always around people who did. And uh, I knew some people that took pigs, and, and they would make, they'd do all this stuff to the pig, and you know, as soon as they gave it room, it would be right back in the mud. Why? Because that pig, it was cleaned up, washed up, perfumed up, put a bow in its, round its neck or whatever you do to it. But inside, there's been no change. And a pig loves the mud. The same with, with a sinful soul. The same with a sinner. You can dress them up. You can bring them to church. You can do all kinds of things but you let go for just a moment and they're right back to the things of sin because there's been no heart change. But you see, when we allow God, and this is what happened to Peter, and this is why this man, this man got up and walked, but I'm, I'm not even gonna read the rest of it, but it's why Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give you. Give I unto you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Peter knew what he had. At the day or, or uh, at the, the upper room in the day, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon them, lived in them. And this was the fulfillment of what Jesus said would happen. And they knew, I've got God living in my soul. God is living in my soul. God is living inside of me. Can I share him with you? Can I tell you about him? I'm not trying to stuff a Bible down your throat. That won't help. I'm trying to tell you about the lover of your soul. And this is what they had. We're talking about revival. We're talking about lifting Jesus higher. We're talking about that, that hour of prayer where we go and God touches us and we realize, okay, because guess what? I mean, Naomi can get on my nerves, as cute as she is. Ooh, boy. Uh, uh, Asher, man, he gets up in the morning. When he gets up, first thing he does is about a 30-second bear hug. You pull him out of his pen and he just... So sweet but you get slow on food service. <laughs> he can scream like a grown man, hurt. Abby, as wonderful as she is, she can get on my nerves. I know I get on hers. Okay, I'm human. But when you get in the presence of Jehovah, when you get in the presence of the, all these things, all these things, they just, the shackles fall, the chains break in the presence of Almighty God. And this is what God is doing in Inchalim, in our community, on the res. God is doing great things. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning. Oh, God, help us. The world needs this Jesus. The world needs you, Jesus, so much. And when we confessed our sins and our need to you, Jesus, you came to live inside of us. You forgave us. You washed our sins away. And you came to live inside of us through the Spirit of Almighty God. Lord God, Lord, I may need to... Uh, 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 borrow some money for a house or a, or a truck from the banker, God, but at the same time when I go to the banker, there, if he's not saved, I've got something he needs to. I may need to get a loan, but he, if he's not saved, he needs to get Jesus in his heart. 
God, the Christian should never feel inferior to anyone in the world. Thoughts of, of discouragement and despair. And Lord, these are foreign to us. They come and they fight against all of us, dear God. I've, I've, I've fought really bad depression at times. But God, in your presence, it's broken. When I've realized what I have in you, so much, so powerful, so great to God. Lord, every care just crumbles at your feet. Thank you, Lord. Help us, Lord, to serve you and be a blessing to our community wherever you give us areas or opportunities to influence God, we ask in Christ's name. Amen.